Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's been a while since we've uh, had uh, Dan and friends. Been quite busy around here, I think, as you all know. So um, good to see you out there in Zoom land. As usual, if you have a question, please stick it in the chat box. I'm here with Nate, and he's helping uh, kind of uh, moderate uh, the Zoom. We're going to go over a couple things. We'll talk a little bit about how busy we are. There's a lot of questions about what our short and long-term care plan, long-term plans are to handle that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our CIP, I guess, campaign. Uh, there was a good deal of questions. Um, I think it's a good thing when uh, you, but I asked for questions for uh, a Dan and Friends or a town hall, and most of them are about parking because while that's not an insufficient, uh, a little thing, um, it still is, in some ways, a relief from like a lot of the uh, family and friends we did regarding COVID and some of the fears and concerns we had then. So we'll get to those questions um, at the end, and um, hopefully this will be uh, a good use of your guys' time. So uh, we've been very, very busy. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Um, usually we go through, we see these peaks that come up. Um, uh, over the course of the years, but they usually only last a few weeks and then we get back to our norm. This has certainly been different uh, over almost uh, at least the last four or five months. It's been consistently either completely full or over full with only maybe a couple of few days respite in between. Uh, so I talked about this a bit uh, at our last town hall, but that was a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, and some of you may not have attended, but the main drivers of this uh, are not COVID. We very little COVID in the house. Um, we're seeing our emergency room visits go back up. Uh, we're on track actually to be at pre-COVID emergency room levels, which if uh, the last three or uh, four months volume is any indicator, we have been close to our 50,000 visit mark. Um, I know those who work in the ED have had a double whammy there because their volumes are up. And unfortunately, um, we have had many inpatient holds in those rooms. And so our ED uh, has had to do really uh, uh, outstanding and really difficult work to manage that level of volume. And you sometimes half the rooms are less than they normally operate with. Um, so uh, a big kudos out to them. I'd like to say I expect that, I would hope that to get better here rapidly, but I don't think that will occur. I think we can hopefully maintain it at somewhat manageable levels. Um, on the inpatient side, we've been, um, in some cases, uh, 20 to 25 patients over our capacity, and we've kept those, those patients in our short stay areas and our OB overflows. Um, so also a big thanks to our short stay staff who have done uh, extra duty and our flex team to care for patients in that area. And then also in our OB unit, we have our OB nurses at times caring for our medical patients. And we really appreciate when you help everybody out and do that. So everybody's been stepping up and doing a really good job with it. Um, we've uh, had been short on staff at times, but at least in the last uh, six weeks, couple of months, have had a little less reliance on, you know, uh, pono pay and uh, people doing double duty as we have been able to get some of our traveler numbers up and have more assistance here. Um, so uh, other short term, I guess shorter term solutions have been that uh, we have opened our transitional care unit down in the south wing of ECD. Um, that has been set up as an official unit. Uh, meaning that just like our medical unit, our PCU and others, it will have a, it has a structure. It's named in our Meditech. Uh, we are hiring the manager. Um, it will. It has all those trappings that um, come with being an official unit. And the reason we set that up is I don't believe our wait list uh, patients will go away anytime in the near future. And even as I hope we're successful in building an expansion of the hospital, uh, we still will have a unit that I think would um, do well to care for those particular types of patients. It is a change for us. We normally scattered our waitlisted patients throughout uh, the organization, but I think by concentrating them in an area, it's a way to, um, to care for that population specifically as well as uh, an efficient way to do it 
uh, which uh, we certainly need being as busy as we are. So um, that has been a gradual progression here over the last year. We went from an overflow area to, you know, we really need to use it probably indefinitely to now an official unit. And I think uh, hopefully over the next few months, we'll get where everyone's very comfortable and we feel like that uh, care that we provide there um, is uh, not temporary, but more permanent in nature. So that is a, I would call that a, a longer term, but not the ultimate solution to our demands uh, for, you know, for additional space to care, care for patients. We are um, campaigning for not just a ICU expansion to 18 beds, but also a 36 bed uh, unit to go on top of uh, the ICU. So that would be third floor and the expansion would be med surge of 36 beds and the second floor 18 beds for ICU. Um, some of you may have seen the series of stories that Hawaii News Now ran. Um, we actually um, had some discussions with them before that. Uh, we knew that um, it's, you, you can't really quote, manage a story like that, but uh, we thought overall that it did convey the message that uh, we are very full. Uh, we do need an investment in infrastructure. The hospital is the same size physically that it was uh, 35 years ago when it was built. And uh, we are very much using every square inch of this place. So hopefully that message is uh, being effectively communicated. Uh, some of you may have seen me bring around different legislators and others. The hospital obviously is owned by the state. And so they are the ones, the taxpayers who invest in the infrastructure. But we of course have to make the case that it's a good use of funds. So we're working on that. Um, um, uh, pretty much is one of our big pieces of work here for the fall and into the spring as we roll into session. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, um, positive feedback that this is a high priority, but we're making the effort to make sure all our legislators can visually see for themselves the, the, you know, the strain that, uh, that we're under, the hard work that we're doing, and how we uh, really need to have good infrastructure for all our patients for our community here in um, East Hawaii. Um, so if any of you, you know, have any questions about that, uh, certainly please let me know. Uh, the other thing that goes with this um, question of being very busy is of course staffing. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little time and I'll go over our employee engagement results, but uh, part of, uh, um, I guess some of the areas where we didn't do well um, are a direct result of our staffing challenges. Um, we've struggled to, at times, to get in adequate numbers of travelers, as well as uh, keep up with the demand uh, when it comes to hiring and so forth. And that's not just something that Hilo Medical Center is struggling with. Our long-term care facilities, um, our uh, sister hospital over in Kona, and then also on Oahu, all the hospitals are greatly struggling with workforce challenges. Uh, we're seeing this in California, up and down the uh, West Coast. I was at a CEO conference, and we're all, I think it's the industry, really struggling to, with having adequate staff. And so as we, our census has grown, uh, we uh, definitely need more staff, and yet unfortunately we're in a really challenging time to get them. So you may ask, well, what are we going to do about that? Well, we definitely want to maximize utilizing all the resources that are available to us. Uh, we've hired uh, really the classes from both our nursing programs here, pretty much the, uh, I would say, three quarters of those two classes have come to work with us. That's 40 new graduates in two groups. That is a, uh, uh, about a fifth of our bedside staff nurse workforce. So I think that will help not only to augment our numbers, but also to reduce, reduce our reliance on um, you know, temporary assistance. Uh, those guys uh, will start to come off their orientation probably in the next couple of months. And I think everyone would be off uh, by the, probably by late spring for the both of those classes. And our intent is to do that again next year and uh, make headway to make sure we have enough staff here to, uh, to make our working conditions great and be able to offer the best uh, care for our patients. 
Um, it's not just nurses that we need. There are a lot of our ancillary areas. We're also uh, working to recruit and making sure we're competitive in the market for our respiratory therapists, our physical therapists, our uh, occupational therapists, and then um, also our nurses aides. Um, some of you may have heard that we're doing a training program for uh, basically we're paying people as we train them to be nurses aides. We completed, we nearly completed our first class of five and another class here, I think is starting next week with 10 nurses aides. And our intent is to keep running those classes until we fill our positions. Uh, they're an important part of our care team. And uh, I just want you to be rest assured we're doing everything we can, our educators, our nursing leadership, uh, to make sure we address those issues. So uh, some of this you guys may have already known, some of it may be filling in the pieces for you, but I thought it would be good for you just to hear it from me. Um, uh, one last subject on, uh, one last thing to cover on that, this, this whole um, issue of being very full, uh, our long-term care facilities, of which we operate for, um, while the acute hospital has had challenges with staffing, has even been greater in long-term care. Uh, during the COVID epidemic, um, uh, a lot of people left the long-term care profession, and a lot of uh, the industry, you know, came under significant challenges. There were, uh, it became more and more expensive to operate, and what we've seen in our uh, local community as well as on the island and across the state is there have been reductions in the amount of long-term care beds that are available and as a result it's been harder to get our patients placed. We also um, as acute hospitals have really competed for uh, nurses and nurses aides and other health care providers they have pulled from our long-term cares which make their staffing challenges even more difficult. So I want to recognize the amount of work that our, uh, our facilities at Ka'u and Honoka and uh, ECD and the Veterans Home are doing. Uh, they also are working very hard and at times stretched, you know, to care for our residents. So uh, as I mentioned, I don't think this is going to solve itself in the next couple months. It's going to be a longer term issue, but we're doing everything we can to mitigate it and make it work. So I'm gonna uh, switch gears here a little bit. We're a little late than we normally do this. Uh, we usually do it in uh, in August, late August, September. And so we're about five, six weeks behind here. But I wanna go over our employee engagement results with you. And I'm just gonna do that in a very high level. We're gonna share our screen here with you. Uh, again, this is just an overview for the whole organization. Uh, a number of your managers uh, have seen this result, these results and they'll be sharing them with you over the next few weeks from a department level. And uh, so let's just, I'm next reminding me to use my arrows here on the key. So um, if we can, can we tighten up that uh, chat box so I can see the whole screen there, just narrow it out. Perfect, thank you. So um, what you're seeing in front of you is just a pretty simple slide. The um, um, green line is the national line of uh, employee engagement score overall for an organization on a scale of one to five. So if you're a four, you know, it's on a one to five, not on like a one to 10. Um, it covers from 2017 to 2022. Right? So what we've seen nationwide is um, that and this is, by the way, the average score. So this is roughly the 50th percentile. The average score for organizations has slowly drifted down, especially over the last three years. COVID was really tough on uh, healthcare organizations and on employees who work there. So employee engagement did come down some. The blue line is us. You know, we started this uh, really focusing on this back in 16 and 17. Our numbers worked their way up. Um, and we've though been kind of stuck, I'll be honest, uh, with our score right around the 4.03, uh, 04 to the 4.1. But our percentile rankings have gone up, gone up somewhat. This year, our score actually went a little down from last year. From um, But it, our percentile ranking went up from a 45th percentile to the 49th. We're right there on the average. Uh, I have to admit I'm not thrilled with that, but um, because I really prefer us rather us be in the top third or the top quartile, but um, at least we've held our ground here. So that's how we did overall against the national average and against ourselves. 
uh, our goal is to get that number more along the 4.12 and the 4.14. That would get us up into the 60, 70th percentile. But honestly, we're going to need to be able to um, we're going to need to be able to uh, address our staffing if we expect that number to improve, because that has really driven some of the uh, um, honestly the dissatisfaction in our workforce. So let's go to the next slide here. Uh, which I've got the arrow, did it switch? Yeah. So um, do me a favor, if you could, can you just pull my uh, pull the screen over there to the, maybe to the, there you go, perfect. Because I don't have this memorized, I have to be honest, I have to see my full screen there. So uh, when you look at engagement, so forth, the things we did really well on is that uh, many of you find our work, your work very meaningful uh, and they like the work they do. And I can tell that in the commitment that we see every day to patients and to each other. Um, we also did quite well in the manager employee domains, which is above the national uh, average. Um, and we increased our percentile rankings in those areas. Most of you are happy with your pay, not meaning that you wouldn't want more pay, but compared to how others in other organizations, uh, it was uh, our score was significantly above the national average. And then we also did really well in satisfaction when being recognized uh, decision and also opportunity to have input on decision making. And our leaders have done a nice job uh, being good communicators. And we spent a lot of time working on that. And so those are all very much positives. Um, from a um, things that we didn't do well, uh, we didn't do well at all in staffing. 39% um, of our employees think we don't have enough, and I would have to admit I agree with you. Uh, we uh, unfortunately didn't make a whole lot of headway from that last year. Uh, we started to climb out of our COVID hole, and then we got hit with a lot of this uh, well, with increased volume and uh, also some of the challenges from our long-term care has been unable to take our patients. All of these things have driven up our staffing needs. I'm hopeful we'll catch up here this year because it certainly will impact uh, your guys' uh, thinking or feelings about our overall organization, how we treat employee safety and patient safety. They're very tied together, and I think it's very legitimate if you go, well, if you care about patient safety, well, then I only should have four patients to care for and not seven, right? That's kind of a logic and uh, a good logic there. And so we do need to get better at staffing and I'm hopeful some of these steps we put in place will improve that. So um, uh, I'll go over some, of, there are a few other things that were high and lows and middle points. We'll get further on, but we'll go one more here um, and talk about, uh, these are the things that we did well in. Uh, so working at the organization three years from now, um, a lot of people want to stay with this organization and have offered a similar position. Um, we did better than the national average overall on a satisfied employee. 78% uh, of you said you would. 75% uh, uh, of you said you'd recommend the organization as a good place to work, which is better than the national average, which is good. Actually, just a little bit underneath it. And, um, and there are some areas that uh, we improved here uh, about being proud to work in uh, for the organization. Fortunately, we declined a bit when it comes to recommend the organizations to family and friends. Uh, and I think that's understandable and that with our staffing issues, you know, at times we feel like we could do better. So uh, we're going to take that as a challenge and, uh, and work to improve that. Uh, how we did by facility, uh, the Veterans Home did the best here, 4.3, Kalu Hospital. Uh, they traditionally do very well there in their employee engagement. Uh, they were at a 4.21. Um, Hilo Medical Center was a 4.2. 01 and then uh, Halehoa Hamakua, who traditionally do very well, they drop quite a bit. And uh, for the, I, would, I know for the same reason that we've all struggled, their staffing has been even tougher, their situation than Hilo Medical Center. And it's been definitely a challenge both for the nurses' aides as well as the nurses. So um, a lot of, you know, I, I made the statement working in nursing for many years that staffing cures a host of ills. If you have enough staff, you can really take care of a lot of different things. So it seems to be very much a common theme here. 
Um, how we did by position, this also validates uh, some of the you know, stresses our clinical team are under, the management or maintenance, our non-clinical professionals, even our nursing and supporting uh, areas, they all did uh, quite well. They did well above the national average. It's when you get to our, our line nurses and our line technicians and others that work that have struggled the most with staffing issues. Obviously their workforce engagement uh, has dropped significantly and uh, we have to address that. And that uh, certainly is a focus for us this year. Um, and I think I kind of covered this, maybe I shouldn't have, maybe this is a little redundant to what I mentioned a couple of slides in, or did I actually go backwards? Oh, let me see. No, okay, I'm, I'm, I think I still got it right. So one of the best things we did was pay and recognition. Um, also that information from the survey will be used to make improvements. Uh, we do use this um, to improve things and your information that you give us um, even when sometimes we don't want to see that we're not doing well in something, it's very useful to know that and um, to know what to direct our efforts at. We also do good, again, as I mentioned, with leaders uh, being good communicators and being involved in decisions. The things we did the poorest in are uh, patient sa employee safety and patient safety. I talked about that when it comes to staffing. And, you know, as we've dug in over the years uh, uh, on the um, on the organization conducting business in an ethical manner. I've heard a number of people tell me, well, you know, if you, uh, it's an ethical issue when you don't staff well enough or you don't have enough for me to give resources for me to give the best care to my patient. And I do agree that uh, that is something that we have to keep working on and improving on. Um, and then uh, the other items, uh, reporting uh, patient safety mistakes without fear of punishment. Uh, we went up just a little bit from last year, but we, by 0.01, but we still lag. I know we've done a lot of work with our uh, risk management and with our reporting system. And I just want to reaffirm to you guys, we do want to hear from your uh, back from you if there are issues that we can do better. So those are things that uh, I believe uh, can be addressed by improving staffing, and there are some focused issues around these items that we also can improve upon. So how did we do with, um, I'm going the wrong way here. So we also, the, the survey measures how we do by teams or departments, and we had some good news here. So just to orient you to the slide, if you're your high performing unit, if you're in the blue, you're a, uh, um, you know, a medium or average performing unit, if you're in the gray, and then you're perhaps struggling a bit if you're in the, um, uh, you're in the red. Um, so this year in 21, we had 28% of our tier three units um, and in 22, uh, it improved to 21. And most of those was a shift to our high performing, highly engaged units, which you really want to see. Uh, I was encouraged by this, despite uh, a lot of the challenges that we've been under. Uh, the units themselves, the departments over, uh, have made uh, quite a bit of progress in uh, being high performing and at the department level, certainly areas where people feel very engaged and want to work. So we want to keep making progress there. And the last slide we'll look at here is our leaders. Our employee engagement survey also measures our line leaders, uh, both individual and your directors and your executives. So the leader score improved from on a scale of one to 100 from 85 to 87. So that part is good. If we lumped uh, everyone together, it would put them in the uh, better than average uh, if, as an average uh, score for our leaders. Um, we do still have opportunity to work with some of our leaders to improve them and get them, um, uh, well, to actually help improve their performance so they very much are highly effective leaders. And um, I'm sure that we can make some progress with that in the coming year. So that was very much a high overview. I'll pull up all your comments. I didn't want to stop in the middle of just going through the slides and then um, answer as best I can any of your particular issues. So we'll stop the screen sharing now. And uh, you'll, I think most of you, when you want to know what the organization did, you're probably more interested in what your department has done. And your managers will be sharing that with you over the next few weeks.
so is ECD included in the H and C results? The answer is yes, um, they are. Uh, is RHC included in common hospital scores? And the answer is yes, they are. Uh, so when those get reviewed with you, uh, I don't really know that, Rochelle. I'll have to look at the, the trend line on page two for HMC, actually the region or HMC. I don't know. I'll have to double check and get back with you on that, Rochelle. And uh, are there other particular questions? Okay. I mean, if there's a takeaway from this is, I guess if I summed it up in a couple lines, we kind of held our ground. We didn't really make much improvement in our employee engagement. Um, and, um, and I think a big reason being for that is we haven't, uh, we haven't handled or licked the staffing issue yet. And um, many of the things we underperformed in really tied directly back to it. And then the actual question of staffing, you're not doing well when, you know, 40% of the, your respondents tell you you're not doing a good job with it. Uh, so we're going to do, we're going to work very hard to address that this year. I don't think we're going to fix it all this year. I have to be honest. We're already a third of the way through the fiscal year, uh, but uh, hopefully, in the next eight, over the next eighteen months, we can um, through our recruiting, all right, we're going to double our nursing classes, and we make some headway on this particular issue. Uh, along with, uh, hopefully, we'll get some additional space to care for our patients. All right. Um, all right, super. So I'm gonna move on uh, to your questions. Um, again, if you have any ones that you wanna ask while I'm going through this, be glad for you to do that um, while I'm reviewing the questions that you guys submitted. So just to remind you, um, uh, when I do questions, if you set them in, if I covered them in my, I guess my monologue here or in my uh, announcements, I don't, uh, like some people ask, well, what are you going to do about uh, more beds? Well, I think we covered that, so I won't read that question. But if your questions are not addressed, I'll read them. Unless, of course, they're just a personal dig at someone, and then, you know, I read it. But uh, I'll save the, I'll spare the crowd from that. So uh, one of the things that were mentioned here is I have a concern during the morning rush of employees parking. Employees are speeding in the parking lot, not paying attention to other employees walking. I've had two near misses uh, walking in the past several months. Uh, it's like Indy 500, uh, like Indy 500 is scary sometimes. So I think we're, uh, we have obviously a number of parking lots here and I have a uh, time seen, I've been over there and I've heard from some of our team that people do drive really fast through them, especially maybe if they're a little late or just because they like to drive fast. So we will have security uh, doing a, a, a renewed watch on how fast people go but in all honesty most of that is just a request for you guys to be considerate you talk about winning both your day and someone else's day if you whip around the corner and you hit someone one of your colleagues so i would encourage you to just kind of slow down uh, and be thoughtful of each other um, let's see uh this one about bikes boss will have a better Carry our system for bike riders to lock up their bikes. I know we only have that one bar out there outside of the UH, by side of the, excuse me, by side of behavioral health. Uh, we're looking to put another one there. Um, and the tricky thing is that we want it all to be uh, underneath the roof because well, we can stick a bike rack anywhere. I think we want it where, um, where it stays out of the rain. So I know we could at least add one more bar. Uh, did a, I saw the bikes and I hope that will address the issue. And if not, we'll have to look to see if we can find some other spot though, but it probably will be farther away from the entrance if we are able to find another location. This one came from, um, from our ancillary areas, uh, imaging. Uh, if there were any plans to increase staffing in ancillary areas such as CT, um, we, Actually, in I don't know specifically for ET, but I know us for CT, but I know in imaging, we uh, are recruiting for a number of the modalities. They're just very hard to find folks. Uh, the, they're in short supply, and we've actually had to make some adjustments in our market rates to make sure we're competitive. But I don't know if your particular area, if um, they're recruiting and haven't been able to fill or there's no plans to recruit. I have to, I'll pass that on to Lisa. 
Uh, there was also in that same comment, are there plans to build onto the emergency room? And the short answer is no, there isn't. Um, I think if you talk to the ER leadership or really most ER nurses, they said they'd be just fine if they just actually had all the beds that are there instead of having inpatient system. Uh, I think our struggle is going to be to make sure our patients, when they're admitted rapidly or reasonable, in a reasonable amount of time, exit the ED so the ED can use those beds. So that's our focus, right? Uh, is the Pink Palace going to be a parking lot for all employees? Now, I think most of you may have noticed, unless you work at the other end of the campus, that the old Pink Palace, the old nursing quarters, that building by the helipad that uh, was falling down, uh, we finally were able to uh, get it appropriately and appropriately disposed of. It had asbestos in it, and also it wasn't just knocking it down. We had to do a bunch of different stuff. But bottom line, we have gotten that building off the campus, and right now it's just a, a bunch of mud. But there is plans uh, here over the next few weeks to um, re resurface it and to work on the drainage and then to gravel it, similar to the old gravel parking lot that we had uh, and then park on it. So the short answer is yes, there'll be parking there. Uh, the longer term plan is to turn it into a proper parking lot, you know, with lighting and engineering and drywalls, all that good stuff. But as our first pass, we want to uh, uh, just create more spaces here, especially as our new office building across the street comes online. Uh, we want to, uh, and those clinics come up to the hospital, we want to make sure there's parking there. There should be approximately 100 stalls, so we're working on how they'll be allocated, uh, so they'll be used most effectively, but I think that will certainly help some of the parking issues, but probably not all of them, right? There was a question about getting volunteers to help disabled or elderly patients to and from their appointments in the areas of construction. We're actually looking at that issue, not just for areas of construction, but just in how patients who come to the hospital get to where they need to go uh, with some with more assistance. As we've put more and more services on the hospital campus and kind of created this one-stop shop on the first floor of the hospital, uh, we, the volume has gone up significantly. So we're working on a plan to be able to, when some patients dropped off, to give them assistance to get to their various clinic uh, or even up to uh, one of our inpatient units. So it's a good point. Uh, we are aware of it and we're working on a solution here. We'd like to get that in place before the building across the street opens. Uh, questions? No questions there. Um, what can be done to expand the toy park? And so I think Pink Palace will help quite a bit. There was a question though that patients um, park in employee parking and employees can't park in patient parking. So um, I think that in general, employee parking is farther away from patient parking. So if patients are parking in employee parking, it's because they can't find patient parking and we need to give up our employee parking so they can park because patients come first, right? So that doesn't mean employees aren't important, but I don't think I'm going to try to really enforce that patients can't park where employees are um, because I think it's most likely, again, because they can't uh, get a spot. Uh, what we can work to do is give you more parking, which is what we're trying to accomplish with that pink palace and opening up those hundred stalls. So I'm hopeful that will alleviate it. I think most patients will, unless we've screwed up the signage, will try to park as close to the building as possible. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to fix that here soon. Thanks for your comment there. There's a question, will the snack shop be returning? Uh, yes, the plans are for the snack shop to be re uh, to return is in, it's being worked on now in the second phase, I think it's phase two or phase three of the lobby construction. And uh, you will have a place to get snacks. There was another question related to snacks that has come concerns that the snacks being sold in the Ohana Cafe, they were all expired. Um, we checked them, uh, they weren't expired, but if you by chance got an expired, bag of Fritos or something. Uh, it wasn't intentional, sorry about that. 
Let's see. Uh, this one, uh, we had a couple of somewhat related to this is hiring and bonuses and relocation pay is being offered for new hires at various HHSC positions. What about retention pay for all of us that are working really hard? I paraphrase that last part and so forth. Um, so we are very uh, careful about, uh, I guess, recruitment bonuses and so forth to try to get people <clears throat> to come work at our facilities. Uh, if they work on the short term, they probably, excuse me, aren't the best thing on the long term. And we only do that when we really are down to no choices. So uh, the areas where we've offered that <clears throat> have been um, in our long-term care areas. We don't uh, do uh, recruitment bonuses uh, or sign-on bonuses as they would go for for uh, any place but Haleohola Kamakua, and we've done that uh, because we have just been unable to get anyone uh, to uh, to work there. As we even struggled with travelers, I think the remote location is a big piece of it. And when you are in a, uh, a staffing shortage, uh, the more remote you are, the even tougher your challenges. And then the other is in our veterans' home, long-term care, again, it's struggled. We've been unable to open the uh, second floor or this one of the wings. So right now we're at 60 beds when we should, uh, 60 residents when we really want to be in the upper 80s. Uh, and our barrier has been recruitment. So not only are we unable to offer the service because we don't have staff, uh, you know, it's financially also pretty uh, difficult for us. So in those areas, we did offer a targeted bonuses uh, for uh, nurses so we can get the next section of the facility open. So it hasn't been everywhere, and we only do that very judiciously when we have no choice. As far as relocation goes, we've been offering different types of relocation for years, and that actually is a standard practice, and the amounts depend uh, on where you're coming from, the overall, I guess, level of the position, but that really is nothing new. The question about retention, pay, and upping pay, this one's also a tricky one for us. I have mentioned this in other town halls. But when it comes to pay in general for um, a bargaining unit for a profession, we don't set the rates of pay. So if you're in BU9, uh, in general, unless we do a certain type of differential, uh, and that has to meet certain criteria, your union bargains along with other members, they bargain collectively. Uh, with really um, the executive branch of the state government uh, for uh, increases to all the various BUs. Uh, we do offer at times shortage differentials based on the market for certain uh, specific professions, but they have to meet a criteria that sh clearly shows that we are paying less than the market. Paying more than the market really doesn't justify a shortage differential. So again, uh, it's not at all to not acknowledge and appreciate uh, the work that many of you have been doing over the last few years, but we can't, uh, honestly, we don't have free discretion to just raise pay. Um, when it comes to asking you guys to do extra work and so forth, uh, we have tried to do what we can do, and I think in some areas quite generously with COVID pay, Mahalo pay, and Pono pay. Um, for those of you who have worked addition beyond your normal uh, your norm, normal FTE, and we greatly appreciate that, and I hope you felt that the um, you know the compensation was appropriate. Let's see. Um, good morning, Dan. TCUs are requesting TV, phone, and be able to order food from the kitchen. So we are installing uh, bedside TVs for our TCU patients. They are in a ward setting, if those of you haven't been there, but we are able to do the small swing-in TVs, so they should be going in here in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, they do have the bedside tables and all. I think they just actually arrived last week. We've been, uh, shipping delays have been a piece of this. Uh, and then we just recently approved the TVs so we'll get them in a little quicker. Um, it's when it comes to room service though, I think it's gonna be very difficult due to the distance from the facility to meet the room service requirements. So at least at this time, we're gonna continue to do house meals, but that's something we may uh, reevaluate as we go along. But uh, I wanted to address your questions there. Um, so there's a question up there about, uh, I think it's on my next page. 
so the emergency exit at the end of the lobby um, is through the ER and lobby front door. So that's the, you have your two exits. So you do have to, but you do have to go either out the ER or you go out the lobby front door, right? So, um, but uh, thanks for bringing that one up. Um, let's see. And uh, we really aren't able to put a, yet another exit in the pharmacy. Uh, that whole design and approval process has been pretty much completed, right? Uh, I got this question, does senior executive management plan to address their ter terrible scores from the employee engagement survey? And so, uh, so I figured I'd read that since uh, it was a pretty pointed question, but while they, the scores aren't in, in the top percentiles like I'd like, I don't think they were terrible. And I think given what our organization has gone through the last couple of years, and the fact that we're on the median, well, I'm not gonna celebrate that. Um, I think that it's something that in some ways that we can use as a good baseline to uh, improve and work on for the next few years. Uh, how much longer will unvaccinated employees continue to be required to do weekly COVID testing? Uh, actually, we're going to start that on Monday. So we had to check because we are part of a corporation and so forth and what, you know, whether we would cause issues in other regions. But uh, so for those of you who are were unvaccinated and have a religious exemption and been testing weekly, this week should be your last week. So I'm sure you'll find that uh, a little bit of a yay. Uh, is there an end in sight now that CD, CD guidelines have changed and soon won't even be requiring masks? I think for the near near term, for sure, where our policy where we wear masks in patient care areas, we'll continue doing that. Um, there's been a significant loosening of those requirements, and if any of you been to the main one recently, uh, Hawaii wears masks much, much more than I would say, well, than the mainland. But uh, right now, we don't really have any plans to change our masking policies. Um, we think that they're working uh, pretty well, but we will continue reviewing them. The CDC just came out with some new guidelines, which were very kind of amorphous. It's like, well, it depends. So we're going to use our judgment here. Let's see, and then of course, what is the plan for the overflow patients already covered that? There was a question about a mandatory overnight, uh, overtime for BU9. So uh, in BU9, um, the employer, because I checked on this before, the employer can require, or excuse me, assign the overtime, but I think if I get the wording correctly, because I'm making sure I wanted to answer this right now. Um, the BU-9 contract doesn't prohibit the employer from assigning overtime. It stipulates the employer has the right to direct its workforce, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it also says that, um, that the employee can uh, decline the overtime if they have reasonable cause or exception, and they don't really define what's reasonable. So I just want to put that out there um, as what the letter of the contract states. But I also will tell you in general, uh, mandatory overtime just is a poor thing. It really should be a thing of last resort. And you only want to do that when you really are going to negatively impact your patients. Um, if I'm working and I've worked a long day or my eight hours or my 12, I'm ready to go home. I don't think it would be great for my employee engagement or morale to tell me I have to stay and work another eight um, and so forth. I may do it because I may see there's no choice, uh, meaning that the patients need it. But is it a good thing for me long term? Is it a good thing for the organization? Am I going to be happy about my workplace? Probably not. Will I maybe be too tired to work the next day and call off and then the problem just gets worse? Yes and yes and yes. So it's something that we really uh, try to hardly do, hardly ever do. And in some of our areas, they've gotten very short staff. I know it's become too common. Uh, we, the reason, the ways we are trying to get where we don't do that is what I mentioned with a greatly expanding our hiring and trying to maximize how many people we can get in to address that issue. And then I know this has impacted our EPW staff as well, especially in our Holocaust facilities and others. Uh, we're trying our best to, well, in some areas, in those areas, uh, improve uh, how we recruit and what we pay for those, you know, focused areas, and then also the training classes that we're doing here uh, at HMC. 
So uh, I'd love to be at a time where everybody goes, what, what's mandatory overtime? You've heard that. But uh, again, it's not a good thing. We use it sparingly. Um, and if you really have, have more detailed questions, just contact you know, HR or Don and then go over the contract with you as well. I think I'll have a couple more and we'll be, uh, we're doing pretty good here. We're only about 45 minutes, should be just a few more. Um, There's a question about a lot of the surveys going around. What's the difference between the major ones? Uh, why are they being set at the same time? Um, we are. We did start this uh, process where we're doing a, a 360 survey for all our managers and leaders. And what it does is, you know, um, I'm in charge of the department. There is an anonymous survey where all the people who report to me and the people I work with can give me feedback so I can have an idea of the areas I do well in and the areas I don't. And it's not used to penalize me, it's used to give me insight. And there's a lot of literature out there that shows that in most cases that will make you a better leader, a better manager. So many of you have expressed, you know, concerns or reservations at different times about their, quote, their boss. Well, uh, this gives you an opportunity to give feedback to that individual, both to encourage and in some cases maybe discourage some behaviors, but it involves you in the process. So that's why you get a lot of these surveys. Uh, they can be a bit of a headache, uh, but we're trying to only do them once a year, but we'd rather there be a little more of a headache and yet have you have the opportunity to give input than no one asks your opinion, okay? Um, as far as them coming all at once, sometimes it seems like that's the case. Um, some of those who have, well, it's just because your particular job, maybe a number of people have listed you as someone who could give feedback. Uh, you may be very popular in getting a lot at one time. Uh, so do your best to participate in them and hopefully it's not too big of an inconvenience. Um, there's a question here about uh, paid parking and could we have a parking system where people could pay to park closer or have premium parking? I mean, it's come up at different times. As, uh, it sounds like a relatively simple solution, but it actually requires a whole lot of uh, uh, organizations, uh, organization behind it. As you can probably tell if you've gone to other hospitals or big employers, uh, especially in cities, you know, they have vendors that handle all their parking because it's actually pretty complicated. And if you're going to take people's money, you got to do it in a certain way. So I don't think that's in the near future for us. That may be something we move to one day, but I don't think it's planned anytime real quick. It was a question about when the ICU will be a closed unit. Um, so that's kind of a clinical question, but um, I, I think I can address that in the in a general way in that we are evolving our ICU care as we get more and more. Uh, if we keep more and more of our patients on island, their critical nature of them increases and the demand increases, which is why we're looking to have a bigger ICU. But just like when you're trying to improve the infrastructure of, of having a larger and a more modern ICU, we're also trying to bulk up the resources where we have people who are specially trained in critical care to manage those patients. Uh, and it takes a while to evolve it. Uh, we added uh, uh, another intensivist to work with Dr. Knox, Dr. Vanell, and we're glad that he's here, but we're figuring out how to evolve the service of working with Dr. Knox and his team in our hospitals to figure out how that should best be done. So it's evolving. It is a matter of discussion. Um, so I can just tell you that it's being worked on. And I think that I covered that until I've been a little while since we had one of these because I got quite a few questions, but um, hopefully I answered everyone's. And if you have any um, uh, anything else that you we didn't cover, then you can always send Mari an email or uh, ask me the next time. I do want to just reiterate and our appreciation, my personal appreciation for how hard you guys are working. I know it's been uh, a stressful time and uh, but I know your family, friends, and your neighbors that you care for, they appreciate it. You know, I've heard a number of feedback, a number of, I won't call them complaints, but feedback from the community about, you know, they had to wait or they were, you know, two days in the ED. I haven't heard one complaint about 
kind of care that they have. The compassion and the quality of it, though, uh, they say it was great. It's just that that gurney was really hard. So let's see if we can fix those things. And thank you for your care. I really appreciate it. Aloha.